From deep inside the Earth's crust, in the Stand Up and Panic studios, Illegible Records proudly presents Illegible Interview Radio. I'm your host, Perry McDonald, and today I'm speaking with Dennis Preston. Now you may be aware that he's a local illustrator and graphic artist from his uh, City Pulse covers and uh, concert posters, but what you may not know, or just recently heard, is that Dennis is also a fine musician. He's got a new CD out on Illegible Records entitled Iceberg, and he's going to play a selection from that for you here live in this studio. Welcome, Dennis Preston. Thank you. <laughs> that was uh, the song Iceberg from the CD, Iceberg, uh, out on Illegible Records uh, that Dennis just recorded. A short version of it. Very short. Short, unplugged, naked, stripped down, voice instrument. That's it. That was it. It was so tiny. <laughs> it was a, It was minute. <laughs> It's a major production <laughs> yeah, on the CD. Right there. And you just heard the whole album. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, Dennis. <laughs> Work with that fun. <laughs> Most people recognize your name, I would think, in the Lansing area as uh, for all the illustrations that you've done, covers and uh, posters. Uh, I, myself, a uh, band that I was in in the early, early 1970s, uh, you did one of our concert posters. Very early. What was it, 72? Yeah, I, yeah, I believe so, 72, 1972. Listeners now will know how old we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's different. It started than, very young. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, you, you were, what, about 18 or so? And oh, you started at the business no. of it, or, or even no, younger? Younger. The Well, the first thing I started doing was painting drum heads for bands, local bands. Really? And the first band I did anything for was Tonto, Tonto and the Renegades. And I did their drum head, and I think I was 14. And then I started doing other drum heads, like for the Ferraris, and I'm trying to think of who else I was doing it for. 
lot of local bands. And then from there, it kind of grew into doing band promo, band logos, band concert posters, and it just kind of took off. And uh, I started freelancing in 11th grade. I started doing a lot of stuff then. And you've been doing it ever since? Yeah, yeah. Just kept going. It just grew. Well, once I graduated, too, right right before I graduated, I started doing some stuff for uh, Sounds and Diversions down in Free Spirit. I painted a mural for them. And, and oh, I, that one that was on the side of the building? No, it wasn't. On, it was inside, inside in the record okay. shop. All right. Oh, yeah, okay. So I had, like, Pink Floyd and the Beatles and a few other bands up there, Jefferson Airplane. But um, I started doing a lot of things for them their ads and then for the whole store it was free spirit was the store that the sounds and diversions was in so i started doing a lot of things for them painting their murals and doing their newspaper ads but um yeah everything just kind of grew all at the same time doing the stuff for the bands and doing uh, this other stuff the more of the commercial art kind of a thing well the it's, it's commercial art doing band posters too well, and for radio stations too. I started doing things for radio stations after high school. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say. I remember uh, seeing the caricatures of the uh, the DJs. Yeah. That they would, uh, see every week. Uh, WVIC. VIC. Yeah, they were the the teenage station at, at the time. At, at the time, <laughs> and they would come out with these sheets with the the top forty or whatever. Yeah, like kind of uh, like a playlist. Yeah, a playlist. Top forty. And you they would always have one of your caricatures on there of uh, one of the DJs. Yeah. Each week would be a different DJ. And that was a cool station back then because at night is when they got out of Top 40. So overnight during those hours is when you hear the really weird cuts off from albums. And that mm-hmm. was cool. Yeah, that was back in the early days of FM. Yeah, it was. Yeah. When it wasn't so controlled. That's right. And now here we are. And here we are on a fake radio station. Uncontrolled. Doing whatever we want. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you are listening to it. <laughs> you can't keep away. <laughs> no. Oh, this is the part where scary music comes in. Okay. But, okay, real quick. We got it. Okay, what do you say to it, people? Oh, that's not scary. Oh. Nope, that's not scary. Nope. It's hard to get scary music off of Dulcimer. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Dulcimers aren't made for scary. You never hear those in horror movies or... No, no. no we no. need one of those little theremin... <laughs> that sounds like a curly. <laughs> 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 He's spinning around on the floor at this moment. Yeah. We'll wait for Dennis to get back up. It takes a little longer as he's getting older now. <laughs> It looks more like a dog chasing the flea on his butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, got, I got the curly uh, the, the connection there. Was... Well, let me try one more time. See no. if I can oh, do it right. Oh, this oh, this is just turning ugly now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a visual, folks. <laughs> I, I can't get it down. It's probably harder than the Macarena. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. More moves, too. Yeah, but you get dizzy going in circles like that on the floor. <laughs> you tried to hear me. Not me. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> I'm envisioning you doing it. <laughs> Dennis has lost it now, folks. I <laughs> He's even tearing up. <laughs> I'm back. Music. <laughs> music. When did you start playing music? Oh. And when I did was, you play? Did I you start pl- out on? I started playing bass. And um, at the time, there was a bass player down the street from me. His name was Don Hess. He was in a band. And he'd always, he, I, whenever I walked by his house, he'd be on the porch playing his bass. And I'd stop by and talk to him and. He had one of those that he didn't have to plug it in. It was a hollow body bass. So he was just there messing around. And then I just started talking to him. And he started showing me things on a bass. The thing was, is when I first started playing any kind of guitar, the bass, or any, I, I was playing it flat and just using my thumb and doing all these runs. 
you know, kind of like a Richie Havens kind of thing. Playing the flat, you mean? <laughs> on my lap, yeah. Your lap and, okay. And Don said, hey, if you're ever going to be in a band, you can't play like that. And so I started learning more how to play like a regular, holding it up, you uh-huh. know. Now, about how old were you at the time? I think I was 16 or 17. And then uh, I did end up in a kind of a band thing, starting out with other people from high school. And then it, uh, closer, uh, yeah, I think it was uh, closer to graduation time. I That last year in high school, I got in a band with a few other people. And we um, once we were out of high school, I was playing more places. We were playing a lot of frat parties and high school parties. And there was a club up in Cadillac, um, the Platters. We played up there. and So we were traveling. We were doing the band thing. And... Um, drive around in a hearse. <laughs> that would have been fun. Yeah, <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> remember all, a lot of Lansing bands. Uh, there was a group called the Shapes of Sound. I don't know if you remember them or not. No. They they were like on the south side, and they had a hearse that they drove around in. Who, who thought, was that? Uh, Nemeth, Doug Nemeth, I think. I remember that name. I couldn't tell you who. Well, they were a little bit older than I was, and they didn't want me hanging around. Oh, but that's they, they, they practiced at a friend of mine's. Who's that boy place. running after our hearse? Well, they knew I was a drummer, and the drummer locked oh. up. He actually chained his drums. Put because chains of around. you? Well, I don't know if it was because of me, but <laughs> he specifically told me, do not touch these drums, because uh. <laughs> he knew I played. <laughs> yeah. You're not touching mine. Oh, but, yeah, from there, after I got out of doing the band thing, I started learning how to play more instruments. So uh, the thing I heard on the radio was uh, mandolin wind. And I got a mandolin and stuff. But I got more into writing my own songs, too. So I used to record a lot with my brother. We would... Uh, is this still high school? or you No, this is that? right after high school. And what we would do is, like... Because he, he was a lot better than I was, anyways, playing guitar. So... You know, he he was writing a lot of songs, too, but we would jam. My mom and dad would go away on weekends to our place up north. And then whenever they go, we got out all the amplifiers, all the instruments, and we got, we just jammed the whole weekend. And you don't, at that age, you don't realize how loud you are to the neighbors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But anyways, we'd be up all night doing this stuff, too. And, like, we would record, and back then... You don't have you don't have the cool stuff that people have now when you're recording. And what we ha- we would do is we record on a cassette player, mm-hmm. and then we hook the cassette player up to an amplifier, so that's coming through. And then we would record the music again on an an eight track cassette recorder. Hmm. I'm not talking like eight tracks where you have eight tracks to play with. I'm talking about the you know, the ones that the truckers were using. Oh, I see. Okay, those big yeah. boxes. <laughs> yeah, the big boxes. So we were recording our music on these big boxes, but we would play along with the stuff that was coming through the amplifier. So we were doing our extra tracks that way. Uh-huh. But um, I I have a few of those songs around somewhere yet, but the, I don't have all of them. Some of the stuff we did was pretty unique, almost like borderline Zappa, Pink Floyd stuff. But... Um, I think that's how I got the itch for recording. The first album that I did, that I did actually record in the studio, was in 76. And uh, some of the musicians, well, one of them at least, was there that night, you know, when we did the CD release show. Uh, Dave Simpson, the guy that played guitar. Oh, okay. So he played guitar on it, and he played drums, and he's really good at, at both, actually. Mm-hmm. So, but the, the album was never released, the... Uh, the recording studio left town took all the tapes with them i only had like the only thing i had left was a cassette mix kind of a rough mix of the what we recorded and even then you know uh there was one song we recorded and his master tapes broke on it and i wish i would have had a nice recording of that but i got like a a mono thing we really layered the vocals on there almost has like a uh kind of like an early King Crimson kind of effect with all the vocals going on there. It's cool, you know. Toys from Hell, I started in 87. And that went on 
for about three, three or four years because I had a trade out with the, um, the guy that was at the time engineering there, and then I found out. You know, I I came there one day. I was doing an album cover his for his band, and then when I came there one day, he was sitting outside, and I go, "What's going on?" He goes, well, "I just got fired," and then I'm thinking, "Whoop! There goes my album." Uh-oh. And, but the studio itself, the recording studio said, um, you know, this is like a week or so after that. And they go, you didn't get to finish your album. I go, no. So I, they worked out a trade and I did it. And, but the thing, you know, working off and on for a few years because I was dealing with their, um, uh, with the paying customers have priority. So it was kind of like I'd get bumped a lot. So. Oh. So that's why I went on for three. And originally, too, it was going to be a joint project with me and my brother. But he lives out on the East Coast. So at least three of his songs are on there. So three of his songs are the bonus tracks on the Toys from Hell that he wrote. And I'm playing with him on there and singing. Mostly I'm singing with him on his songs. He's doing a lot of the playing and some of the other musicians. Um, Ed Englert is on there. He's playing on two of my brother's songs actually yeah so. i was in a band with ed myself there for a while he gets around yeah we, were, <laughs> we both found ourselves up in petoskey whoa uh, there's a guitar player named uh, eric cherry that lured us up there but that was a good time petoskey's nice yeah our our big idea was to play all the uh the local bars uh, they had quite a bar scene going there then, and year round because they have the skiing in the winter time, and then the that's true the summer yeah. people right there in Lake Michigan in the, in the summertime. Uh, but this was 1976, just about the time that disco hit Michigan. Oh, and all a, those clubs went to records and DJs. That's right. A lot of bands felt it once that came in. Just. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> so that brings us to uh, Iceberg. <laughs> yeah, segue. Um, Iceberg, originally, what I did is I, I approached Eric. Uh, okay, I approached. Say it right. It's an easy word. <laughs> Approach. Well, anyways, I came up to Eric at a, uh, it was the uh, way station block what was it? What, writer's Block. Oh, Writer's Block. Yeah, I was there that day. Yeah, and I asked him, you know, if there was something he would be interested in putting out some of my basement tapes because I have a load of those. I got enough for like three or four albums worth. And and he said, no, we don't do that kind of stuff. But then like not too long after that, not that same day, um, I did talk to him again. And he said, well, I'd be interested in recording an album that's all new stuff. I thought, okay, you know, new songs. I didn't, I had a lot of songs I I would have liked to record, you know, but then like when he was saying new songs, I'm thinking, man, what do do I have that's new? So um, by the time I did start recording, I did have enough songs. And then there was more songs, you know, that just kind of grew right out of the uh, sessions. So that's how the album came to be. Iceberg... Um, originally the, it was that I didn't have an idea what I was going to call the album or anything at the time when, you know, when he said, well, let's record an album. So, and I wanted to avoid the toys from hell thing again, where reading a book and I got inspired by the lyrics and just jumped out there and did a cover and everything this, you know, I, this time I wanted to take a different approach to what was going to happen with this album. So I waited, you know, almost, geez, almost to the end of the the recording sessions before I actually knew what I was going to call it or think of for a cover. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember the cover. It was like down to the wire. It it was. Eric was already burning CDs, wasn't he? Ah, it was close to it. it. Yeah, because I don't think the artwork was done for that yet. Yeah, he he probably was burning them right at that time while I was still trying to work on a cover for it. I think that, yeah. I think that's what was going on. Do you want to talk about stories behind some of the songs? Sure. Uh, let me see. The Tipo Feo one, originally, um, that went, 
that, that was inspired by a guy that I drew a long time ago. Um, his name was Lyle Hubert, and he was like an ugly looking guy. And I started doing a comic strip of him for an ecology newspaper. They liked him. I didn't know where I was going to go with him, but then they saw him. I did some flyers just thinking, oh, sometime I'll do a comic strip. But then they saw him and they wanted to, me to come up with one for him. So he was the original ugly looking guy there, ugly guy. But um, later on, I came up with some t-shirts around 1995, some ugly guy t-shirts. And the main thing with the the inspiration for that was like a scripture where it said that um, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know, so not really judging people by their looks or what they wear, their skin color and things like that. So that's kind of like um, where the inspiration for that song came from. But behind the face they don't know Under wrinkles deep inside An excellent treasure God did hide Deep at that time too it wasn't part of it wasn't in Spanish and that was kind of like a different decision too because my daughter was taking Spanish classes and I thought well it'd be cool to have her sing some of this in Spanish it sounds great too it's, well thanks it's, it's uh, different isn't it yeah you, you know, I know that some other people have done things like that 
sang part of the lyrics in another language, you uh-huh. know, but I wanted her to have a taste of like recording and getting something out there with her vocals on it. Um, also, the other thing too is like um, a friend of mine, Kevin, you know, I, I just wanted to get some things out there that he could play on too. So that's why the second part of the song, you know, has him doing some of the kind of Herp Albert kind of feel to it, you know. And I thought it tied in good anyways with the nylon string guitar to have a trumpet going in there. Yeah. It's a real nice sound. It was he's a good trumpet player. Yeah, he is. Yeah. You know? But you know, that was the thing too, is like when I signed up for the label, you know, Eric says, Yeah, other artists on the label like to record on other people's uh, CDs and go well, that's cool you know and then I was you know wondering if I could have some of my friends play on there too that weren't on the label and like I'm just, sure you know so that worked out pretty cool you know and, and Jim's playing uh, whistle on that, uh, Gandalf's groove and uh, that was cool it's almost like a battle cry kind of thing and, and the thing too is like for having Eric on there you know it, I don't think there's any other recordings on the label right now where you can hear Eric's voice. <laughs> <laughs> but when he was doing it, I, I thought, oh, that would be cool on that song, you know, because originally that was just me doodling, and he goes, that's a song. I go, no, it's not. And yeah, it is, you know. So um, th- it was just a groove. There's no chord changes. Just the groove was there. But then once he put his part on and Jim played the whistle on there I thought yeah that's cool that works and I'm finding out from a few people that that's their favorite song off in there too because it's just different you know my older brother I sent him a CD and he emailed back he goes, he goes every time that plays I smile <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when you guys were uh, I think you were just putting down the basic tracks for it you were kind of joking around about it but you wanted him on your CD. Yeah, too. well, yeah. I was like, oh, man, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and just mine and not and, yours? And I didn't actually, well, I don't think it, he, he wasn't going to do it I on mine? yours either. Oh. <laughs> from He's... from the way I understood it, it was just like, you know, that'd be too embarrassing. I, in fact, I didn't actually realize that he had recorded it until I heard the final version. Oh. <laughs> Plus, I got him singing on another one. He's singing. Oh, yeah, that's. Comfort that's... me. He's singing. Yeah, he's singing background on that. I thought he did really good. lowly before the throne your tender mercy hears my groans see your creation on its knees only you can meet this need
and he was telling me, he goes, I haven't sung before on any of these things, you know, and I think he should do an album. I think he should do one with vocals. It would be different. Could have him, like, uh, doing cowboy songs. Yeah. Yodeling cowboy songs. Yeah. That's his, that's it right there. That's, that's, yeah, that's his niche. (laughs) Hint, hint. (laughs) As far as I know, nobody else on the label is planning on doing yodeling cowboy songs. I think he should do it. I think we should. I think uh, we could uh, get a little harmonica and lay around some of the background. And we, uh, we could force him if he wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, tackle blackmail him. Yeah. Oh, oh, blackmail. Yeah. I got some some photos of him picking his nose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, but you're good with Photoshop. You can. I could. I could put somebody else's <laughs> finger up his nose. <laughs> All right, well, how about ah. some of these other songs? Um, Gorilla. Gorilla. That's, that features you on there with the percussion. Actually, that was going to be called Happy Monkey, but after you got on there, I thought, more that's more Gorilla than Monkey. <laughs> it was just such... It, it's almost like I could visualize, you know, a gorilla throwing around the suitcases like that commercial, you know. Oh, because yeah. it, it's so heavy sounding, you know. Once you come in there and I'm going, that's a gorilla. That's not a monkey. <laughs> yeah. Why did you think of monkey in the first place? Oh, originally but, happy monkey. When you hear just the guitar part, it's so happy and bouncy, you know. But then, like the percussion, that's a big monkey. It, it had to be a gorilla. bin like a big plastic bin and just from it just had this coolest sound if you hit it right directly in the middle on the bottom it had this great low bud yeah big and i think it has to do with the uh i'm not sure but i think it has to do with the thickness of the plastic it's really extra thick plastic because i've got bins at home that i they don't do it they don't do it no it's just part of it could have been the miking too once you put the extra reverb on there and a little bit of bass Makes it sound big. Maybe so. It sounds really big on uh, the Travel by Dark one on, mm-hmm. on there. It sounds big. It's got a big sound to it.
about some of these other songs, some of the later ones in the CD? Sad uh, to see you go. Sad to see you go, and um, rocking the pond. Rocking the pond and ripple, ripple on. on. They're all inspired um, by a, a death of a friend of mine. He was murdered about a year ago, and I. All, all three of those songs basically came to me within the first few days. Well, I think even one of them came the night that I found out about it. And it was just, you know, like inspiration for songs come from different places. And for me, uh, that was one of them, I think, out of sadness for one thing, you know. Um, when somebody dies that you know, it just kind of leaves a big hole there, and some people express themselves different ways. And I don't know, I was getting them song in songs. The ripple on the the sad, sad for you to go one was just you know the out of sadness and uh, somebody the rock in the pond was basically taking the event and kind of. Uh, using symbolism, you know, about throwing the rock in the pond, you know, kind of symbolism for the murder itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the water laid suspended in the air for days, that's part of the lyrics, was kind of like people were just kind of blown away. Kind of in shock. Yeah, in shock. And it was like he was a a member of the community that a lot of people knew. Mm -hmm. So... It was the kind of thing, too, you know, it was like uh, the reaction of the community because, like, you know, the event happens, but it doesn't go away right away. So it was just like people were frozen in their their emotions for a few days there. So the lyrics kind of represent those kinds of things, but not in the uh, the actual, um, I don't, actual words of the event. You know, it is symbolism. Somebody threw the rock in the pond And the splash lasted for many days The water lay suspended in the air And the ripples never go away Uh, Ripple on um the reason for that song is because of uh the jazz influence on that is because this guy really liked jazz and i wanted to do kind of a tribute thing i i don't mention his name some people know who he is but i don't i don't want to use it as something to try to capitalize or yeah Yeah. you know it's more of a tribute thing to him right and uh the other thing with Ripple On is like when somebody does die, it, it's like their life and their death, um, it affects everything, you know, it just ripples on. It's almost like a chain reaction thing. So it's kind of like it, their life keeps going on through different kinds of things. It affects different people and, uh, and it ripples on. So it's just like things just, and, and that's what the thing I wanted to catch with the song. Originally the song was going to be about 10 minutes long and didn't end up that way but it still has that feel of going into another change thing Mm -hmm. you know once the acoustic instruments come in there and the still it still carries the the even though it goes acoustic in a weird kind of thing the the jazz part of it comes back in with the trumpet and that was something that at the time it worked out really cool because Kevin's playing trumpet on that and he just took a little break for a while. So it worked out cool to bring those instruments in and then the trumpet comes back in over the top of it and it just it sounds cool tying those two styles together. And Kevin at the time didn't know that we were going to end up doing that to the song. So mm. it just fit together cool. I liked it, you know. And, and the way that we did it at the CD release show it was cool too. I've had a few people say that they would have liked it to have lasted longer. Like, oh yeah, that would have been cool, you know, doing like a, almost like a 20 to 30 minute jam, just going through all these changes, you know, and that yeah, would have been cool. It was fun. You should have been there, kids.
Dennis Preston, Iceberg. Look for it in stores. <laughs> it is in some stores. We've got it in uh, Schuler's. Uh, at the time of this recording of this show, it's in Schuler's and Okemos. And pretty soon it will be Schuler's Eastwood Mall. And uh, it's at uh, Elderly Instruments. And pretty soon it will be at Flat Black and Circular. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Dennis. Thanks for coming over. and Yeah. And, and speaking uh, about jamming, I think we ought to jam. We could give it a shot. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>